So when one is a young scholar, one must say complicated things to make one seem smart. But when one is an old scholar like I am, you can afford to say simple things and people don't think you're stupid. So what I want to say today is a bunch of simple things and I hope you don't think I'm stupid because I'm frustrated, not stupid. I'm frustrated by the fact that so long into this debate, certain simple, obvious points have yet to be recognized. So here's the first obvious point. There is an internet. There is an internet, and it does things. It makes things possible. It makes not possible things possible. Well, here's an example. There's an artist, his name is Kutaman. Here's him describing his one, project. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Welcome to Through You. I would like to thank all the people and artists that took part in this project. So here's the project he's talking about. It's a project called Through You. And what Through You does is take snippets from videos on YouTube, thousands of videos on YouTube, and puts them together in new artistic works. Here's a little bit of a, one example. Well, what can I do? He could play that 16th note groove just straight. Going. You'll be amazed. Okay. Do it again. All right. Um, I would need more than one guitar part. There'll okay. Be somebody playing single notes, somebody playing chords, and they'll mix them together. Uh, okay. And let's just pick the mother of all funk chords. Let's pick a ninth chord. Uh, Or here's another example. I'm sure some of you saw this incredible film from 1985, The Breakfast Club, John Hughes's classic. Some of you might know this music by the band, uh, uh, by the band Phoenix Listomania. Someone inspired by both of these decided they'd try to remix The Breakfast Club and Listomania together. This is what they produced. So this video became a hit, quickly spreading virally on the internet, and that inspired some people to make their own versions of it. So some people in Brooklyn made a version, this was theirs. And then San Francisco had to take up the charge. More than 55 of these across the, the world, from every corner of the world, cousins too, I don't know what that is, but anyway, everybody across the world remaking the same creativity, expressing the same sequence of innovation. Well, here's another final example. This is a man named Bo. It's a great thing about America, you can be a man named Bo. So here he is, a man named Bo. He comes from Vermont. And in Vermont, they grow kale, the vegetable kale. So he decided he would set up this website to sell 
handmade t-shirts, and this handmade t-shirt says, eat more kale. This is a company, Chick-fil-A. They have many stores like this. They don't like gay people much, and this is their horrible food. Um, <laughs> but they have a really clever advertising theme. See these cows painting, eat more chicken. Okay, so this was cute, this is clever, but you might notice, notice a similarity between eat more chicken and eat more kale. And they noticed it too. And they didn't like this eat more kale slogan. So this multi-billion dollar company sent a letter to Bo. And here's Bo's reaction. Out of the blue, I received a legal letter from Atlanta, Georgia. It knocked the wind out of me. I felt like I had been punched. I had to reread the letter again and again. I'd never seen a letter like that before. Time now for the ridiculous, and tonight we're adding a David and Goliath story we like to call Chick-fil-A versus the T-shirt guy. I'm a micro biz in Vermont making a handful of hand-printed shirts versus a multi-billion dollar corporation that sells just under 500 sandwiches per minute. The company is threatening to shut the guy down because it says that eat more kale is too close to its eat more chicken slogan. They feel like they own the words eat and more. And the thing is, is more isn't even spelled correctly. Chick-fil-A managers wouldn't go on tape, but in a statement they said they'll continue to protect their trademark until the artist stops printing his kale t-shirts and turns over his website. To be told by some billionaires in the deep south that it has to stop? Are you kidding me? They've done it to others. They gladly sent me a list of 30 others that they've shut down. It's sort of like the, you know, the bully at the schoolyard. You know, basically he tells you what to do and you're going to do it or you're going to get your nose in the dirt. Please, Chick, that hurts. Don't do it anymore. Are you going to be on my side if I let you up? Sure, Chick, sure. I'm on your side. Chick fil Get out of the way. You're hurting a lot of businesses, and this is a big deal for a lot of people. Is that true? Are you going to sell that to us? Oh, you got a guy making t-shirts in Vermont. Who the hell do they think they are? That's not what this country was based on. I'm inside a Chick-fil-A. I didn't buy any food, but I did get an iced tea. I want to be the guy that stands up to him and, and wins and, and says, I'm not taking your bullshit. I'm not going to back down just because you say I should. Okay, so James Lance wanted to make this as a real documentary. That's just a trailer. So what they did is they took this trailer and they put it up on Kickstarter, which of course is a platform to enable artists to fund their creativity through contingent commitments. People say, I'm happy to promise $100 if you get the amount of money that you need to do your project. So they put their post up, and within three months, they raised all the money they needed to get the documentary going. And here's the striking thing about Kickstarter. Last year, the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts in the United States, giving grants to artists across the United States, this is the federal government's project, raised $157 million, which they gave to artists. In the same period of time, Kickstarter raised $200 million to fund new art projects. All right, now take these examples. Here's the point of these examples. None of these stories would have been possible before the internet. This story would not have been possible because there would not have been a YouTube to gather the clips together to make this creativity. This story would not be possible because kids would not be inspired from around the world to remake this video. They never would have seen such a video. And this would never have been possible because in Vermont, nobody could have found 1,976 people to fund this new documentary. It's only because it can speak to the whole world that they can find the people necessary to fund this documentary. The net makes things possible, makes things that were not possible, possible, makes creativity that was not possible, possible. 
And here's the second obvious point then. This fact should be relevant to culture policy. Okay, now, I said there's an internet, doesn't seem controversial, but what is this internet? How should it be understood? And I think we have to recognize it as a capacity, a technology that connects and empowers and produces an opportunity that would be impossible without it. And then we step back and say, is that good? Should we encourage it? And here I'm going to demonstrate my fluency with Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> All things being equal, yes, obviously, all things being equal, we should support liberty over restriction, unless there's some great harm. So what could the harm be? Well, people point to lots of potential harms from the internet, to privacy, to anonymity, whatever. I want to talk about the harm from copyright. What is the harm from copyright that might lead us to shut down this opportunity for creativity? Well, copyright, of course, has inspired an explosion of what people call, quote, piracy. And the fight between the copyright maximalists and the pirates has led many people to begin to call themselves abolitionists. People who believe that copyright should be abolished. It's no longer necessary, especially in a digital age. I am not an abolitionist. I believe copyright is necessary. And the reason I believe it is an obvious point that all of us should recognize. Copyright, in my view, is a necessary regulation necessary to solve what economists call externality problem. Now, what's externality? Well, let's go to the source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia. And what Wikipedia tells us is an externality is a, an impact, positive or negative, on any party not involved in a given economic transaction. So negative externality, loud noise from a concert, the horrible fumes from a pig farm, the carbon spewed into the atmosphere from coal-fired power plants. These are negative externalities. And then positive externalities are the good done, for example, by bees, by pollinating farmland, the good done by children suffering vaccination to keep other people healthy, and the good done by artists in creating culture. These are positive externalities. They benefit people, not part of the transaction. Externalities, which cause the economists think problems. And the problems they cause is a problem of supply. The unregulated market produces what economists say is an inefficient supply of these externalities. For negative externalities, an unregulated market produces too many of them. For positive externalities, an unregulated market produces too few of them. So what we need is regulation to, quote, internalize these externalities. So, for example, we need a carbon tax to limit the amount of carbon that companies spew into the atmosphere, leading to global warming. And in the context of a positive externality, we need the regulation called copyright. Now, that's obvious. It should be uncontroversial. Fourth obvious statement, we need copyright, and then a little bit of the academic addition, to remedy positive externalities, but less obvious is to recognize this point. The regulation we need is a function of the technology. The right regulation is a function of the technology of the time. And as technology changes, the right regulation changes. Now, this too should be obvious. This too should be true. But with copyright, we seem to have forgotten this obvious point. We inherited a law designed for the analog age, and we fight to apply it to the digital age. And by fight, I mean to embrace the rhetoric of those who are waging this, quote, war, what they call the, quote, copyright wars, what Jack Valenti, the former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, used to refer to as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. Now, we wage this war for perfect control of, quote, copies, and worse, we proceed as regulators without asking does this system make sense? And what does it cost? We embrace this idea and march forward without these questions. So, for example, think in the context of science. I was reading an article in the Harvard Gazette, which was interviewing this new economist at Harvard, Gita Gopinath. 
and the writer noticed there were no books on her shelves. So asked her, why aren't there any books on her shelves? Her response was, everything I need is on the internet now. Now, what exactly does that mean? So I decided I wanted to test this. I've been doing work on corruption. I went to Google Scholar and I typed in campaign finance. I got a list of the top 10 articles. But I was accessing this list, not from a Harvard computer. So then I wanted to see how easily I could get to these 10 articles. So the first article I could get access to if I paid $29.95. The second article was protected by JSTOR, terms unknowable. Third article, $29.95. Fourth article, I could get it for free, but only if I bought a yearly subscription for $99.95 to that journal. The sixth article, JSTOR protected it. Seventh article, JSTOR protected it, but I was, could buy it for $10. Eighth article, JSTOR again protected it. Ninth article, JSTOR protected it. Tenth article, JSTOR protected it. And so on to the eleventh article too, $29.95. So how accessible? Well, the top articles about campaign finance reform, well, one of them was free, one time only. One of them cost $10, three of them $29.95, and five of them terms unknown. So when she says everything is on the internet now, what does she mean? She means if, and this is a big if, you are a tenured professor at an elite university, or maybe a professor at an elite university, or a student professor at an elite university, or a student professor at US universities, you take your pick. If you're one of the knowledge elite, then you have free access. The rest of the world, not so much. Now, we should name this. Its name should be outrageous. Here's Hillary Clinton uttering that name. It's outrageous because we built this world. We academics built this world. It flows from the choices that we make about our copyright. But here, copyright is not serving the purpose of enabling authors. Not one of these authors gets money from their copyright. Not one of them wants the distribution limited. This, for these articles, def authors defeats copyright's purpose. Here's another example. The rise of, quote, pirates. This is New Zealand. Transparency International says New Zealand is the least corrupt nation in the world. But I've been to New Zealand. There are pirates in New Zealand. Who are they? People just like you. People who want access to English movies, English language movies. But it never pays to license New Zealand because the transaction costs are too high, so they can't buy them legally. So what do they do? They launch the largest pirate service available to get access to these movies so that they can get them even though they're getting them illegally. Or these terrorists, I'm sorry, not terrorists, children. That's who we're talking about, children. These two increasingly engage in what we think of as piracy, and when they do that, we call them criminal. But here's the question. What does it do to them to be raised with the tag criminal on top of their head? What does it change in the way they think about themselves? And is that cost worth it? Now, here's my second invocation of my wide knowledge of the Swedish, lang Swedish language. Nay, <laughs> given the alternatives, this cost is not worth it. So here's the fundamental point. It is time for us as policymakers to rethink this problem, not rethink copyright, Copyright is essential. Rethink the architecture of copyright. Copyright has an architecture. Its application gets triggered upon the production of a copy. What we need to ask is, does that architecture best advance copyright's objectives to help and protect and support authors, given the architecture of the age, given there is an internet? Okay, now, the frustration I feel when I talk about this problem is that this conversation has not even begun. Fifteen years after it should have been obvious to everybody, there is still no fundamental change in the way governments are talking about the architecture of copyright. No fundamental change in the architecture of its regulation. Why is that? Well, I think it's a combination of ideology and interest, but let's start with the interest first the interest of the most dominant policymaker in this space, the United States. And I want to tell a story, and all stories begin like this. Once upon a time, there was a place called Lesterland. 
you don't know because the introduction didn't include it because it's a secret, so don't tell anybody. My first name is actually Lester, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester. So here I want to make fun of Lester, so I want to make fun of Lesterland. Lesterland looks a lot like the United States. Like the United States, it has about 300 million people, and like the United States, 144,000 of those people are named Lester. So that means 0.05% of, of Lesterland is named Lester. But in Lesterland, Lesters have an extraordinary power. There are two elections in Lesterland every election cycle. One of them is called the general election. The other is called the Lester election. In the Lester election, Lesters get to vote. In the general election, citizens get to vote. But here's the catch. To run in the general election in Lesterland, you must do extremely well in the Lester election. Not necessarily win, but you must do extremely well. Okay, so here's the picture of democracy. What can we say about Lesterland? Well, the obvious point is the dependence upon Lesters that candidates have is going to produce a subtle, understated, camouflaged bending of their views to keep the Lesters happy. And reform that angers the Lesters in Lesterland is, we could say, highly unlikely. All right, that's Lesterland. Here's the point I want you to recognize. The United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States looks like this, too. The United States also has two elections. One of them is called the general election. The other is called the money election. In the general election, all citizens get to vote. In the money election, funders of the elections get to vote by giving their money to the candidates who need their money to run in the general election. Now, to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the money election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. And here's the key to this analogy. There are just as few relevant funders in the United States as there are Lester's in Lesterland. And you say, really? 0.05%? Well, here are the numbers. In 2010, 0.26%, one quarter of 1% of America gave $200 to a congressional candidate. 0.05% gave the maximum amount allowed under the law to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, gave $10,000 or more in a congressional election cycle. And in this presidential election cycle so far, 0.00015%, for those of you doing the numbers, that's 47 Americans have given 42% of the super PAC money spent in the presidential elections to date. So you look at that range, 0 0.26, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, I think it's fair for me to say it's the 0.05% who are the funders, and these are our Lesters. Now, like we can say about Lester land, this is what we can say about USA land. This dependence upon the funders is going to produce a subtle and understated and camouflaged bending to keep the funders happy. Candidates spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress. As any of us would, as they do this, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, as they constantly adjust their view on what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issue 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. Okay, number one, they bend to keep the funders happy, and number two, reform that angers the funders is in this system highly unlikely. So in that sense, USA is Lesterland, and in that sense, the United States system has become corrupted. Now, I don't mean corrupted by brown paper bags filled with cash. I don't mean Rob Blagojevich kind of corruption where you buy office through financial payment. I don't mean any illegal act. I'm not accusing anybody of violating the law. Instead, I mean corruption relative to our framers' baseline for how this system would function. The framers gave us what they called a republic, by which they meant a representative democracy.
by which they meant a government that would have a branch, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. You have the people, you have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that, right? Okay. People and the government. An exclusive dependency, and so would the public good be found through that exclusive dependency. But the problem is, Congress has evolved a different dependence. No longer a dependence upon the people alone, increasingly a dependence upon the funders. This is a dependence too. But it produces different and conflicting dependence because it's de uh, from a dependence upon the people alone, so long as the funders are not the people. Now, this corruption has an effect. It separates the people from the government, but most important to the issue here is it blocks the possibility of reform. It blocks it on every important issue, from global warming to healthcare to internet policy to copyright reform, and it blocks it most especially with copyright reform. And so will that block remain, so long as the system for funding elections that we have in the United States remains. So when we look at interest in the dominant par partisan policy maker, there is no chance this interest will shift anytime soon. Now, in addition to interest, there's ideology, especially here or especially in parts of this part of the world, an ideology French-like in the overriding civil right that copyright is supposed to recognize. But here is the point. No one needs to challenge the ideology in order to recognize the changes that copyright needs. This architecture does not fit, it does not serve the ideology, copyright's purpose, to help artists. And it could serve copyright's purpose if we re-architected it, if we pointed to sensible policy that could define the way our, our copyright functioned. So here are the elements to that sensible policy. Number one, copyright must be simple. If it's meant to regulate 15-year-olds, 15-year-olds must understand it. They don't today. We have to remake it so that it's simple. Number two, it has to be efficient. The copyright system is a property system, but it's also the most inefficient property system known to man. You can't know who owns what. The basic promise of a property system is not delivered. You can't know who owns what, and the only remedy to that problem is to return to a system of formalities, not on creation, let the artist get the copyright upon the creation of the great work, but in order to maintain the protection the government promises. The artist must do something to make it easy to know who owns what. Number three, the regulation has to be targeted. We need to regulate selectively and as a consequence, deregulate a significant space of culture, leaving it free from copyright's control. So if you think about the difference between copying something and remixing it, and the difference between a professional and an amateur, we get this matrix, too academic, I appreciate, but okay, just bear with me. Copyright regulates all of this in the same way today. That makes no sense. Certainly, copyright should regulate effectively the professional controlling copies of, complete copies of his or her work. But also, we should certainly set free from copyright's regulation amateurs simply engaging in the process of remixing other people's work. And then between these two easy cases, there are harder mixed cases that the law must deal with in a more subtle way. But the point here is we have to focus regulation where the regulation can do some good. And number four, we have to be realistic. As we've seen the explosion of peer-to-peer -peer internationally, the rise of what people call, quote, pirates, we need to recognize that this war that has been waged so effectively for a decade has been a total failure. Now, I recognize the response of some to a failed war, in particular the United States, is just to double down and to wage an ever more effective war against the enemy, but my argument is for the opposite. We should be suing for peace in the middle of this war and looking at proposals that might give us what we need without the costs of this war. Proposals like compulsory licenses or voluntary collective licenses or the German Green Party suggesting for a cultural flat rate. And if we think about these alternatives, we can then recognize if we had had those changes a decade ago, how would the world be different today? Well, number one, 
artists would have had more money. Because in this war against piracy, it's not the artists who get any money, it's just the lawyers. Number two, there would have been more competition by business because the rules would have been clearer and everybody, not just Apple or Google, could get into the game of competing to innovate to build these new businesses. But most important to me, number three, we would not have a generation of, quote, criminals who have grown up recognizing themselves as criminals. These are the elements of reform. And now we need people to lead. The United States is hopeless as a leader here, so long as the United States remains Lesterland. But you, and if not just you, then the EU could lead here. There is an internet. It makes things. It creates. So we need to create for it a copyright policy that allows that creativity to be celebrated. So let me end with one final recognition. If you're here at this conference, you recognize this. We can't kill this creativity that we see coming out of this network. We can only criminalize it. We can't stop our kids from engaging in this kind of creativity. We can only drive it underground. We're not going to make our kids passive the way at least I was growing up. We can only make them, quote, pirates. And the fundamental question that democracies have to answer is, is that good? In my country, kids grow up in this age of prohibitions. They constantly live their life against the law in wide ranges of their existence, against the law. But that is corrosive and corrupting to the rule of law in a democracy. We must lead now to end this insanity and push towards sanity that could give artists what copyright promised. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. It's really a good speech. Some chocolate for you. <laughs> Thank you.